Good afternoon. Um, <clears throat> uh, for those, some of you who have not been here before, uh, that's the Brooklyn Bridge, which is the logo of this uh, activity. It's intended to mean that we're connecting uh, advances in basic biological and engineering sciences uh, with human health and, and medicine. And we are the people on the catwalk halfway between Brooklyn and Manhattan. Uh, and the important thing is that once you build something like this, life is never the same on either side. Uh, wonderful things happen. And the same thing happens when people of different disciplines sit down, have coffee, talk, and learn the other person's language. And that's the whole intent of trying to demystify. Maybe we should call the course Linguistic 1A or something like that. So I have an important announcement here because I just found out today, and this is more for the people who are listening and watching, usually two to 400 a week just on the NIH campus. Uh, previously, these sessions were live only within the NIH uh, environment, your computer. But it turns out that all these sessions can now be viewed anywhere on Earth or space by just going to videocastnih.gov, and that's live. And then one or two weeks later, all the sessions are put up on YouTube and the NIH video archive for the whole 12 years that we've been doing this. So you can access it. Uh, Many, most of our uh, sessions uh, are actually accessed. The numbers get up into the several thousand. So we must be doing something right. So there, in this, the program for this year, there is a sort of background to uh, uh, about five of the sessions. And the background is inflammation uh, to set on fire. And way back in the first century, uh, infectious inflammation, abscesses, boils, infected wounds, uh, led to the classic description that inflammation is characterized by heat, redness, swelling, pain, and loss of function. But here in the 21st century, inflammation has now broadened its scope. In fact, it's hard to find any entity from a clinical perspective in which inflammation is not involved. So several of the sessions that we will continue to have during the year concern the role of inflammation and in other disease processes which have not conventionally been identified as associated with inflammation as a major determinant of the phenotype. So last week, we heard about uh, cardiovascular disease from Dr. Gallen. This week, allergies will, are one of the main topics that will be brought up. And you'll see in February, immunosuppressive diseases, HIV, cancer, fibrosis, autoimmune, neurodegenerative obesity. It's almost as if every area of clinical medicine has an important component that's related to inflammation and to the complex inflammatory cycles that take place, as well as the host responses uh, in terms of the complexities of the immune system. So today we're gonna to consider something that uh, for an area which for many years can be said to have had somewhat of a prolonged infancy, I think, uh, but has now progressed well into and beyond adolescence and is truly an explosive area of uh, biomedical research and important clinical findings uh, into the big umbrella of glycomics. It's obviously that uh, the genome, the sequence, hasn't answered everything and it's raised many, many more questions which keep things 
bubbling along. And epigenetics is, is certainly one of the major aspects of uh, uh, complications. And today's uh, post-translational modifications of glycoproteins and glycolipid uh, turn out to be critical in many, many functions in regulation and disease. Uh, there is a link to inflammation, which we will hear about. These diseases are both inheritable and acquired. So uh, we have uh, three speakers uh, today, and I'm going to very briefly introduce them all to you. Uh, the best tennis player of the lot is John Hanover, who's chief of the Laboratory of Cell and Molecular Biology in NIDDK. John received his PhD from Hopkins and has been here since 1981 when he was a postdoctoral fellow in Ira Paston's lab. And John is truly one of the major movers in uh, enhancing the recognition of glycoprotein biology and pathobiology. And our second speaker is Michelle Bond, who received her PhD in organic chemistry from Stanford uh, and is a staff scientist uh, in the NIDD, in NIDDK uh, in Dr. Hanover's uh, uh, area. And the third is Jonathan Lyons. Jonathan, where did you go to medical school? The University of Southern California. I'm sorry, I didn't see it in the, in the thing here, but I, okay. So John is a clinical investigator in the genetics and pathogenesis allergy section in the Laboratory of Allergic Diseases in NIAID. And he's been interested in studying the consequences of altered glycosylation in allergy and, and atrophy. So we're very grateful to the three of you for being willing to spend a couple of hours in exciting us about this important area which you've played such a critical part in. Just forward in my hand, yeah. So, uh, hello everyone, good afternoon. Um, I'm John Hanover and I'm a glycobiologist. No, it's not a 12-step program. Uh, you don't have to say, hi, John. Uh, but I'm a self, I'm an avowed uh, glycobiologist and um, how, how many TED Talk fans do we have here? Any TED Talk fans? Okay. So, for those of you who are not familiar with the genre, this is someone who gets up, an engaging speaker, speaks in a contrarian voice about something you think you know about, but you actually don't. Um, I'm going to do just the opposite of a TED Talk. I'm going to talk about something that I think no one really cares to know about in, 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 when they're training. Uh, but then later on in their training, they realize, I should have been paying attention when they talked about carbohydrate metabolism. I hope we can convince you of that today. Um, because in my view, glycans and the origin of life on the planet are really glycans that have uh, developed the ability to self-replicate by the formation of nucleic acids, and then propagate to the most abundant biomolecules on Earth. So it's a lot to be interested in, okay? And with regard to human disease, um, I, wanna, I wanna start with this slide, which gives, I think, a, a really a, a tribute to the, to the predecessors, uh, my predecessors and others in the intramural program. This really has been one of the hubs of biomedical research, particularly in glycoscience, um, for the past 50 years. The work uh, of, of, of carbohydrate chemists, Claude Hudson and Fletcher, shown here, and the work of the esteemed glycobiologists shown below, Gil Ashwell, Liz Neufeld, Victor Ginsberg, and Roscoe Brady. And I've had the good fortune of working in and around all of these folks. Um, I want to also mention the Glycoscience Interest Group. If we capture your attention today on May 5th on this campus at Nature, there'll be what is known as Glyco Day. Uh, it's a really wonderful meeting with glycobiologists, and if, if you're interested in any of this, it's a really wonderful way to spend a day, uh, May 5th of this year. And then I also want to give a nod out to the Undiagnosed, uh, Undiagnosed Disease Program, headed by Bill Gall. Um, they are an important part 
of the intramural program. John works closely with them, and I think he'll have more to say about that at the end. So uh, this is a quote from my colleague Bill. Um, I like to say that rare diseases provide rare insights, and the way Bill expressed this is here. He said, people with rare diseases give humanity so much scientifically and spiritually that we owe them a huge debt of gratitude. In fact, they make us more human. And so I'm really, I'm really pleased that this community has, um, has embraced the rare disease program. And as you know, there's a rare disease program uh, day every, uh, every year on the NIH campus. So my intersection with what we're going to be talking about today really started uh, a few years ago. Um, and, and this individual, uh, Matt Wilsey and, and his wife, um, were, um, were trying to identify the disease underlying uh, their daughter Grace's affliction. Um, she went to, he went to a number of uh, clinics with very little, um, very little insight uh, until he approached a genomicist who was willing to perform exon sequencing for Grace. And the long story short was that, that Grace was actually born with a deficiency in an enzyme called NGLY1 that I had blundered upon, and I use that word directly, blundered upon, as a graduate student in the 1970s working with Bill and Art. That enzyme is an enzyme that cleaves the in-link glycosylation chain in the cytoplasm off proteins that are retrotranslocated from the ER. At about the same time, Matt, M Matthew Might, shown here meeting with our former president, um, President Obama, on, uh, on a, this was the press conference regarding precision medicine, um, had, had, a, had a, uh, a daughter that was also affected. In fact, sorry, her, his son was affected, and, that, and his son is shown here. Um, and those two uh, drivers have been advocates of patient uh, these really are patient advocates for rare diseases. And these two gentlemen, the, the two Matthews, as I call them, have really pushed awareness of rare diseases. These, uh, and John may mention uh, this deficiency in GLY-1. It's a very, very rare glycosylation disorder and really considered the first of the um, disorders of glycosylation associated with carbohydrate removal. And we are actively working on the NGLY-1 problem. Today, though, we want to focus on the role of glycans and physiology, particularly related to the immune system. And so after a brief overview that I'll be giving on glycoproteins and physiology and disease, um, I'd like to just briefly touch on glycoprotein biogenesis and the CDGs as a field. Uh, and then Michelle will give uh, a little bit more detail on the nucleotide sugars and why we think they're both an understudied and important area of research. And then we're going to talk, John's going to talk more um, clinically about PGM3 deficiency, which is tied to nucleotide sugar metabolism and carbohydrate metabolism. So we have a fairly full agenda. And so let me start uh, by uh, telling you that carbohydrates and their recognition are important for all aspects of cell physiology. No more so, uh, this is no more apparent than in the immune system, where really glycans are involved in so many aspects that it's hard to enumerate them. For example, the, they're involved in innate immunity and adaptive immunity through recognition of carbohydrates on pathogen cell surface, activation of immune cells, um, trafficking uh, of neutrophils across the so-called uh, uh, neutro neutrophil migration, um, the extravasation of immune cells, and in fact, the production of antibodies and antibody structure. So it's really very, very no aspect of, of immunology that isn't touched by glycan. So when we talk about glycans generically, we're really talking about a very broad class of biomolecules. Um, some of them are shown here. I'm going to be focusing uh, most of the discussion today on the N-glycans uh, shown here. That's in part because they're, they represent the most abundant kinds of congenital disorders of glycosylation. However, uh, you can see here that the O-glycans, uh, other, other O-glycans such as those modifying notch, um, GPI-anchored glycoproteins, which are quite abundant, uh, and various forms of glycosaminoglycans, very, very long, non-template-driven chains that are acidic that sequester nearly every growth factor that's important for cell activation. Okay? So, with this, that as a background, let me tell you why 
glycobiologists um, have been recruited into many areas of modern pathophysiology. The rarity and severity of genetic diseases highlight the importance of this. In fact, these congenital disorders of glycosylation are typically less than 1 in 20,000 in the U.S. population, yet they reveal principles that are applicable to other chronic human diseases. Some examples of these diseases are shown here, and this is by no means exhaustive. Uh, the defective O-glycosylation seen in muscular dystrophy. Uh, some, some work that we and others have done on O-glycosylation. You'll be hearing more about this, this later, particularly its role in diabetes, Alzheimer's, cancer, and heart disease. Uh, not signaling, which is mediated by glycans. The selectins, uh, one of the key players in the inflammatory response. Siglex and their regulation of immunity, and the galactins, which play a key role in uh, recognition and immunity. Uh, the proteoglycans themselves, by sequestering growth factors and binding microbes and, 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 and uh, being involved in morphogenesis, are major targets, and, and you'll, we'll be talking about those in a moment. Um, most glycans, glycans play a key role in virus entry and the ability of bacteria to home to the surface on the bacterial uh, surfaces in our gut. Uh, the so-called microbiome is dictated in large part by glycans. Um, heparin, this drug is actually a gag. Uh, people don't think of it that way, but it's actually a glucosaminoglycan. It's actually one of the most important, um, in terms of preserving life, of drugs out there, and yet people don't realize it, uh, that it is, in fact, a gag. Um, there are also many monoclonal therapeutics, and the glycoforms of these antibodies are quite important. Um, Cancer biomarkers is an extremely important growth area, trying to identify both immunologic targets and also uh, markers for diagnosis. And finally, the vaccines to infectious uh, organisms, most are, are actually targeted to glycan. So we can't ignore this area biomedically. So uh, I want to kind of extend what, uh, what Wynn began here by talking about the, the glycogenome. And actually, the glycogenome, even though it's understudied scientifically, if you look at the scientific literature, actually represents about 5% of the human genome. 5% of the human genome encodes enzymes that act on carbohydrates. Uh, about 2% of the human genome encodes glycosyl transferase. Now, that's an enormous expenditure of energy to make this post-translational modification. The glycogenome uh, being different from the way we think about information molecule assembly normally, template-driven, is actually mediated by, uh, uh, by modifications of the encoded proteome. So the glycotranscriptome encodes the, the proteome acted upon by glycosyl transferases and glycosidases to create this vast assemblage of complex molecules that, uh, that represents the, the so-called glycome, as Wynn mentioned. That is also true in the glycolipids. And between them, these two abundant molecules represent non-template-driven diversity and information. An example of how this works is shown here. Uh, a nucleotide sugar donor typically transfers to a protein acceptor. These, these are template-driven in the sense that one uh, precursor has to be made before it can be extended. And so by spatially separating the enzymes of of, uh, in, in different subset or compartments, you can actually organize the stepwise assembly of the pathway. And we'll be talking about how that happens and why it's important and how it can be deregulated. So uh, I may be the only glycobiologist in the country who's also head of a genomics uh, core facility. Uh, and don't ask me how that happened. But um, one of the remarkable things that's happened in science in the last few years is the tremendous explosion through new gen sequencing of uh, exome sequencing. So um, exome and genome sequencing has greatly accelerated not just the discovery of the congenital disorders, but other fairly rare disorders. The Genome Project uh, actually also fueled the growth of the so-called COSI database, the carbohydrate-acting enzymes that we now know about structurally came from the Genome Project, uh, and particularly the microbiome project. Exome sequencing costs have plummeted. And I, I really like this graph. Do, does everyone know here what Moore's Law is? Any engineers in the group? Moore's Law came about as a result of the transistor industry 
because it was noted that transistors, the number of, of circuits you could print on transistors um, followed this, this kind of law. That is, the cost dropped precipitously with time. And up until this date, 2008, in fact, sequencing pretty much followed Moore's law. At that point, new gen sequencing, Illumina sequencing uh, being an example, caused this dramatic drop in the cost per genome. And you can see right now, I mean, it's not exactly free, but the human genome costs have dropped precipitously. So estimates suggest by, that, that with current, uh, probably presently uh, the 10,000 genomes we have available to examine, that 20 percent, 20 percent of the population, African American and European American, have congenital disorder glycosylation alleles. So um, if we look then at the rates of detection, the ability to see uh, both carrier mutations and the ability to diagnose diseases that appear in young children, particularly through pedi pediatric screening, uh, has dramatically increased. Now, John's going to talk about this in much greater detail, but I wanted to give a bit of a historical um, uh, reminiscence about this, because the way this field has progressed is that uh, the, the young uh, folks who present with the congenital disorders have a few common features, hypotonia uh, uh, being the, perhaps the most, um, the most obvious. Um, they have, in some cases, fairly severe psychomotor problems, um, and so when people uh, bring these young kids to the pediatrician, it is not always the pediatrician who diagnoses these children. Um, and so I, I want to show how uh, these, these are typically diagnosed. So for many years, biochemical measures were used to screen these kids. And uh, Hud Freeze, in a very recent review article, has listed these with some appropriate references. And I can give you the reference to this if you want to follow up on that. But in general, People have followed the disorder by following serum proteins like transferrin and the electrophoretic mobility of those proteins on gel, which has been very diagnostic of change in the glycosylation pattern. For GPI anchors, there's a whole series of markers, uh, and there are some enzyme markers, some better than others, um, which will allow a partial diagnosis of GPI anchors, and John will elaborate on this later. Uh, for the alpha, uh, alpha district glycanopathies, um, there's a, a pretty good antibody that allows the diagnosis of this, and this has been used clinically now for at least 15 years, to my knowledge. Um, so what are we talking about? Okay, with these diseases, um, the, the most abundant by far are those in, in glycans, defects in the glycosylation of in glycans. About 40 gene products, 40 gene products are involved in the assembly of this structure. So <laughs> when you think about that, that's a tremendous amount of energy to put in, the, in a structure that is so highly conserved. Now, I'll show you in a moment that that's, that is so highly conserved because it is absolutely essential for cellular proteostasis, for the folding reaction and the proper quality control in the ER. The second most abundant of the glycosamine glycans, we discussed those briefly, these repeating disaccharide chains made of acidic uh, residues. Uh, typically glucuronic and hydronic acid being the charged species, the GPI anchored proteins, and then a whole series of, of CDGs associated with O-glycan biosynthesis, in particular those associated with uh, the mucin type, uh, these are the mucin type O-glycans and other glycans on molecules like NOTCH involved in morphogen gradient. So I'm going to focus on N-glycosylation because it's both the most abundant and perhaps the easiest to understand for a general audience. Um, what do we know? Well, we know that throughout metazoa, this oligosaccharide shown here is assembled in a stepwise pattern on a lipid anchor. This lipid anchor is a polyisoprenoid called dolichol. This structure is built up with three glucose residues. It is then trimmed down on the Golgi. So it's built up and trimmed down to create diversity. How do we know this? Well, we learned this in part from biochemistry, many years of biochemistry. Inhibitors of the type I'm showing here, there, these, some of these have actually been used clinically to inhibit these pathways. We've also learned a lot from yeast and somatic cell genetics, uh, and I think perhaps most importantly for today's discussion, from human congenital disorders of glycosylation. Um, many 
pathways were actually first described as congenital disorders. <laughs> it's very interesting. So this is one field where the human diseases are really instructive of the biochemistry and genetics. So the most common form of CDG uh, affects this N-linked glycosylation pathway. There's about 40 gene products. Uh, this common precursor that I was talking about is assembled um, largely within the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum, although the initial steps in this pathway are actually built up on the cytoplasmic surface. Um, and, and so while we tend to think of glycosylation as being restricted to the endomembrane system, that is within the ER and Golgi, the initial steps of this pathway, at least, are actually cytoplasmic events. And that was actually what I did my thesis on many years ago, when it mattered. Um, so why do we go through this elaborate multi-step process? It turns out that glycosylation represents one of the key quality control mechanisms in the ER. And two diseases in, are instructive in this that I'd like to highlight. So the, the on-block transfer of the oligosaccharide lipid assembled in the ways I've just described to a growing polypeptide chain occurs um, in the ER co-translationally or immediately after, pro, pro, uh, after translation on the ribosome. The reason that's important is because you need to add a big sugar, a big bulky sugar, in a kinetically limited time and in a kinetic and in a physically limited space. You're adding uh, as many as 14 uh, gl glucose and, and mannose residues uh, with an acylglucosamine, all in about, it's been calculated, 30 to 40 milliseconds. That can only be done by an activated nucleotide sugar. Couldn't be done stepwise the way other glycosylation reactions occur. Upon addition, that protein uh, is then subject to retention by a series of lectins that hold it in the ER until folding occurs. When proper folding occurs, it is released and allowed to be um, uh, moved through the secretory pathway. However, there's a thing called a mannose timer, which allows uh, this, this mannose timer actually monitors the quality of the protein, detects regions of, of misfolded disorder, and reglucosylates those that don't pass quality control. Upon reglucosylation, it binds to the lectin. It can't leave the ER. So we, what we really have here, I don't know whether you guys remember watching Lucy, the Lucy show where Lucy and, and, uh, and Ethel are in the assembly line with the chocolates, right? And they're sitting there, and as the chocolates go by, for, originally they can keep up. Then all of a sudden, my God, and they're throwing chocolates in their mouth, and it's horrible, right? You've got to see it if you haven't seen it. This is a lot like that. If, if, you, if you screw up this basic homeostatic mechanism, folding goes awry. We know that because in glyg one deficiency um, is a disease of protein folding. That is, in glyg one which is involved removing this glycan after it's been retrotranslocated out of the ER, really screws up proteosomal degradation of protein. So the disposal of these proteins is dependent upon removing this glycan chain that results from misfolding. Another uh, disease, uh, for those of you who heard Sergio Rosenweig talk last uh, year, is the, the, the MOG deficiency, which is involved in these early stages of in glycan synthesis. Uh, if, you don't, if you actually don't carry out these initial steps in the glucosylation reaction, you, uh, you have a protein folding defect. Okay. Just to complete this story, there are a lot of congenital disorders of glycosylation that occur in the ER. However, there are many that occur in the Golgi. The Golgi is the site of processing and elaboration of this complex structure. And uh, if you go to a glycoscience or glycobiology meeting, there's a lot, there's still a lot of interest in how all of these enzymes are regulated. It's a little bit like a chorus, like the uh, Mormon Tabernacle Choir, where you have the sopranos and the altos, everyone singing but they're doing it in this one common space, and they need to harmonize. And that's really what the Golgi does, it is thought, for this assembly line, stepwise uh, modification of carbohydrates. If we look by compartment, you can see that uh, in the cytosol that we're going to be talking, Michelle's going to tell us a little more about this, that, that uh, the Dolokhov pathway, the Manos pathway, and the ER represent a substantial percentage of these. The ER Golgi intermediate compartment, there's one. I think there's actually more than one now known. Uh, and then finally, there are some 20 uh, 
enzymes that are deregulated in the Golgi. And with that, I'm going to turn uh, the podium over to my younger and more capable colleagues. Um, enough of my ranting. And, and we're going to talk a little bit about some work we're doing jointly to understand one of these diseases and how we approach it experimentally. So I'm going to invite my colleague Michelle Bond to continue the discussion. And uh, can you see that? It's on a clip. I can't see. All right, hopefully, yes, you can all hear me. All right, so thank you, John. And um, I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking a little bit more about the molecular details about what John was talking about in um, his slide deck. And what I'm going to argue is that being able to understand exactly what's happening on both a biological and chemical level for all of the pathways that are required for glycan synthesis will be incredibly important for understanding the molecular details of the diseases, uh, the congenital disorders of glycosylation. And so um, some of that uh, lies in the fact that these glycans are chemically incredibly complex. They, so they can be very large and they're dynamically altered. So John talked a little bit about N-glycans and I'm gonna talk uh, a little bit about one particular sugar modification toward the end of my talk. But what do we start with? Well, we have some sort of protein, which is represented by the uh, circle here, and then we have a sugar that's appended to it. And that sugar could be something as complex as this N-link glycan here, which is attached to an asparagine residue, or it could be as simple as O-glycnac, which is attached to a serine or threonine. And so one of the things I wanted to point out that's in common for both of these glycans is the fact that N-acetylglucosamine, which is the blue sugar, is common for both of them. And interestingly and incredibly importantly, UDP glycnac, so a sugar nucleotide, and N-acetylglucosamine are going to be um, common for the vast majority of glycans that the cell synthesizes. Now, how do we get to um, either of these ultimate, uh, or to these sugars being placed on glycans? Well, we have to have some sort of glycoconjugate acceptor, so a protein or a lipid. And we have to have an activated sugar donor, which is what I'm gonna talk a little bit about on the next several slides. And we can't have a sugar that is not, an, um, a, not high, a high energy molecule due to the fact that the, the sugar wouldn't have any sort of leaving group for the um, glycosyl transferase to be able to utilize. And so we have a glycoconjugate acceptor. We have some sort of sugar donor, which I have uh, written here as NDP or nucleotide diphosphate sugar and a glycosyl transferase. There are also um, other important components that make sure that the uh, acceptor, donor, and glycosyl transferases are all at the right place, in the right time, at the right concentrations for all of these reactions to take place effectively. And um, some of those are uh, also nucleotide sugar transporters, which I'll talk a little bit about, and glycan remodeling enzymes, or glycosidases, which um, I don't think we're gonna spend any time talking about today. So I wanted to start by talking about what exactly is a uh, nucleotide sugar. And what I have here is the, st the structure of UDP glycnac. And I've elected to use UDP glycnac um, as this is an important theme throughout what I'm talking about and what John is gonna talk about in, um, in his slide set as well. So we have two important components of the nucleotide sugar. We have the nucleotide, so uridine diphosphate, and then we have the sugar portion, which is on the left in blue, which is N-acetylglucosamine. The sugar is in an alpha linkage to these two phosphate groups, and this is an activated sugar molecule. And what do I mean by that? Well, you're probably much more familiar with ATP, and this is also a very active molecule. So all of the uh, negative charges that you see both on um, the uh, UDP, so the uridine diphosphate, and the ATP are mutually repulsive, making these highly active and highly energetic molecules. 
And so the non-reducing terminus of one of these large glycans that John was talking about can attack the anomeric position of um, this sugar right here, meaning that the UDP will be a good leaving group. And this is something that couldn't happen um, without this molecule uh, being intact. So how do we get to the synthesis of this NDP sugar? We have a sugar that is either scavenged <laughs> from um, uh, degradation products within the cell or it's from nutrients that are from the extracellular milieu and it is phosphorylated at the sixth position. And this is an incredibly important step because this traps the sugar within the cell. The uh, sugar can no longer uh, diffuse. And the second step, that sugar 6-phosphate is converted to a sugar 1-phosphate. And finally, that sugar 1-phosphate is converted to an NDP sugar. And this is fairly ubiquitous for the production of all of these sugar nucleotides. And that's a fairly simplistic view, but what I'd like to talk about is um, the integrated process that's required for the synthesis of multiple um, sugar nucleotide, uh, nucleotide sugars. And you'll notice that on this slide, we have um, eight of the nine sugar building blocks. So galactose, glucose, um, fructose, glycnac, mannac, fucose, or excuse me, glycnac, mannose, fucose, mannac, and sialic acid. And in most cases, we can go from an individual sugar monosaccharide in several steps uh, to the production of that nucleotide sugar. What's really interesting, and uh, the reason that UDP glycnac is actually in the middle, is, is not by accident. It's importantly integrated in the synthesis of um, multiple sugars. So you can see that glucose can be converted to glucose 6-phosphate, which in several steps can actually be converted to glycnac 6-phosphate, thereby um, being a component of UDP glycnac. So this pathway here is actually termed the hexosamine biosynthetic pathway. Importantly, though, there are other inputs for the hexosamine biosynthetic pathway, starting with glycnac itself. Um, one other thing that is key to note is that all of these pathways have rate-limiting enzymes, which are um, in the red boxes. And those rate-limiting enzymes, in some cases, can also be feedback inhibited by the ultimate product of their pathway. So for example, DFAT here can be feedback inhibited by UDP glycnac, meaning that if there is um, a, an, an overabundance of UDP glycnac, the hexosamine biosynthetic pathway um, is going to um, stop producing this product. The other important thing to note is that um, here I've, just, I've starred the different um, uh, enzymes that are, have, are actually disease associated. And I think this is critical to consider given that the concentration of all of these different components are is, is incredibly important for the construction of the appropriate uh, glycans on the cell surface or within the cell. And I think it's also key to note that what John Lyons will be talking about in a minute is PGM3, which is actually um, within this pathway for the production of UDP glycnac. So we have a sugar that's converted to the sugar nucleotide and now that sugar nucleotide needs to be in the right place at the right time. And so the sugar nucleotides are by and large synthesized within the cytosol. The only exception is CMP sialic acid, which is synthesized in the nucleus. And these uh, nucleotide sugars um, can be used within the cytosol by an enzyme that I'm gonna talk about in a moment called OGT. But otherwise, these sugars need to make it into the lumen of the ER or the Golgi. And um, as you're well aware, these cellular membranes, including the uh, membranes of the Golgi and ER, are biological barriers. So they're selectively permeable to uh, a particular uh, subset of molecules. And because of that, and because NDP sugars are um, negatively charged, 
the cellular membrane is not permissive to the nucleotide diphosphate sugars. So there has to be some sort of trans transport mechanism. And um, there are a variety of transporters that are localized within the um, ER, and ER and Golgi that are responsible for translocation of NDP sugars from the cytosol to the lumen of these organelles. And interestingly, these are, all, are actually considered antiporters because they require the nucleoside monophosphate or nucleotide monophosphate to be effluxed at the same time as the NDP sugar is um, imported. You can see from this particular slide that there are a whole host of different um, nucleotide sugar transporters, one for each different type of nucleotide. And some of them are um, exclusive to mammals, others are present in multiple other organisms. And beyond the fact that there is one um, nucleotide sugar transporter or, or multiple for each individual sugar nucleotide, what's interesting is the fact that they're selectively localized. So you can see that CMP sialic acid, for example, that transporter is only localized within the Golgi because CMP sialic acid is only utilized within the Golgi. It has no role in the, um, in the ER. And like the previous, uh, one of the previous slides where I showed you that there are uh, mutations in a number of these enzymes are uh, associated with disease, you can see that um, the, there, are a, there are a number of these transporters, transporters that are also associated with disease, diseases. And so CMP sialic acid and GDP fucose are actually um, examples of enzymes that are implicated in two congenital disorders of glycosylation, supporting the fact that the synthesis of these nucleotide sugars is, um, is critical for the appropriate uh, production of glycans. Now, like I mentioned before, um, I wanted to focus a little bit on UDP glycnac. And interestingly, there are three transporters that are responsible for the um, correct localization of UDP glycnac. You can see um, from this slide that UDP glycnac is present in a number of different compartments within the cell. So it's localized, it's, it's made in the cytosol, and then it is imported into the Golgi and ER where it's concentrated. And, um, the Golgi and in the Golgi and ER, uh, as John showed you, a number of those um, end link structures actually contain um, glycnac and uh, contain glycnac. However, what I'd like to focus on is the, uh, the use of UDP glycnac within the cytosol. And you can see here, this is a just a horizontal view of the hexose mean biosynthetic pathway, where we're going from glucose to the production of UDP glycnac. And while UDP glycnac um, can be used for uh, the glycosylation of a variety of these different types of proteins, um, what I think is important to note is that it is uh, critical for the glycosylation of what I would consider perhaps the simplest um, glycan, which is um, O-glycnac, so N-acetylglucosamine uh, hooked to a serine or threonine residue. And this happens uh, within the, the cytosol or nucleus, and uh, one enzyme is responsible for the addition of O-glycnac to target protein. So UDP glycnac is that donor sugar uh, nucleotide. OGT uses that donor sugar, and UDP is the, the byproduct. And what I'd like to focus on on this particular slide is that the imports for the hexosamine biosynthetic pathway are a variety of different types of nutrients. So they range, it um, requires glucose, glutamine, acetyl-CoA, uridine, and ATP, uh, which supports the fact that we think of O-glycnac as a nutrient sensor. So it senses a variety of different um, changes within the cell, ranging from nutrients to stress. And indeed, O-glycnac is actually critically important for a variety of different um, biological processes. It's important for regulating whether or not proteins are degraded. Um, it's critical for whether proteins are folded or aggregate, and that um, can be seen in a variety of neurodegenerative diseases. For example, um, tau is oglycnac modified. Um, whether a pro particular protein is oglycnac modified will change its location from the cytosol to the nucleus, which may in fact change um, 
the transcription of uh, downstream genes. And finally, um, although this is not an exhaustive list, Oglicknack is implicated in um, regulating the cell cycle. And so one of the things that we've been asking is what happens when uh, Oglicknack is perturbed in disease? And um, if Oglicknack is regulated appropriately, you have a physiological homeostasis. However, if Oglicknack is perturbed, you may have a disease state that begins and can end if either some sort of nutrient change um, is ameliorated or a stressor is removed. However, eventually you may have a pathology that cannot change, and that can be seen if you remove OGT from um, mice, for example, that results in embryonically or in, in lethality. And so what I'd like to conclude with and turn, turn over the podium to John is simply that um, Oglicknack, because it is a, a nutrient sensor and um, downstream of UDP Glicknack, which is a critical nucleotide sugar that's important for not only Oglicknack, but the production of other glycans, um, is going to be essential for us to understand a variety of different types of diseases. And again, I'd like to point out that PGM3 is part of this pathway for the synthesis of UDP Glicknack. So, thank you. So the question was about sugars that can be modified by phosphate groups. And so sugars can be modified in a number of ways, including um, by sulfation as well. And so those are uh, found in those um, large, like, um, what are they, the heparin, not heparin, the, um, I'll let you finish. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but um, so the, the, the sulfated use uh, the PAPS donor, which is a, uh, typical of all sulfotransferases. They're mostly in glycoprotein hormones, uh, particularly luteinizing hormone uh, and, um, and uh, growth hormone and um, other rarer um, peptide hormones. With regard to the phosphate, um, the MANO6 phosphate recognition system, which holds all lysosomal enzymes in the ER, is actually mediated by a two-step process where you actually transfer a glucosamine phosphate uh, onto a terminal um, sugar and then remove the so-called capping glucknack to, to, so you end up with a terminal uh, uh, phosphate. And that's actually a very, very abundant phosphorylated species. So it's a good question, yeah. They, and, and actually it was the basis for uh, understanding the lysosomal storage diseases, yeah. So uh, John, um, is glycosylation a limiting factor in uh, so cellular regeneration, uh, wound repair, uh, cell division. Yeah, so that's a very good question. They, uh, Michelle talked a little bit about what's limiting, particularly with hexosamine synthesis, and hyaluronic acid um, is, is actually very important for wound healing. It's actually critical for wound healing. Hyaluronic acid is the single biggest utilizer of the UDP glucneck hexosamine pool in cells. And in fact, it can limit the ability of the pathway Michelle just talked about, Oglucknack, from functioning. So, um, you know, wound healing is actually limited by the formation of hyaluronic acid. It's, it's one of the most abundant molecules made. And, and because it's uh, one of the uronic, it, it, it requires a tremendous pool of UDP glucknack. And maybe a C, we could actually have a demystifying medicine just on hyaluronic acid <laughs> and hyaluronidases. Okay. Do we have any others want to ask questions? And if not, we'll have a break at the end because John can get up yeah. here with us and answer the things we don't know. So we'll take how long? A five minute break? Uh, when? Uh, I think we can continue. Break. It's all okay. right. Okay. All right. Perfect. All right. Perfect. That way we'll get people out of here a little earlier. <laughs> Absolutely. Hmm. Ah, that was very good. All right. Am I on still? Good. Okay. So, um, when I was preparing for this talk, I was thinking a little bit about some sort of analogy that would sort of make sense in terms of thinking about the way I think about sort of glycosylation. Um, and water actually kind of came to mind. 
Um, so this is a, a nearly dried up reservoir outside of San Jose, California. Um, as you know, they've been in drought until actually the, just this winter. Um, and when you think about glycosylation and, and water, uh, both are entirely essential for life. Uh, without um, them, there would be no life. And virtually all of these um, disorders that we have discussed already and the one that I'm going to be talking about are not complete loss of function because virtually all of those would be embryonically lethal, at least in mouse models, and certainly we believe so in humans as well. Um, we've also learned that there are a lot of specific mechanisms and, and uh, uh, safeguards in place to uh, procure water um, and, and, and gly uh, glycans. Um, and as we've learned with CDGs and as we've learned in Flint, Michigan, uh, if those kinds of safeguards uh, go away, we end up with human disease. Um, and finally, um, both with, with sugars and with, with, with water, it's likely that just a little bit is not enough. We know that for water, and we certainly think so for sugars as well, um, that we really need um, many of these things to be abundant for, for life to thrive and for us to successfully um, um, do all of the natural processes that are required for us to, to live as humans. So um, with that in mind, we'll move on to some glycosylation disorders. As an allergy immunology physician, I really focus primarily on the allergy side of things. Um, but we, in our lab, um, Josh Milner is my section chief. Um, as the name denotes genetics and pathogenesis of allergy section, we've really been interested in sort of single gene disorders, looking for monogenic disorders that lead to really bad allergic problems, um, but also look at known single gene disorders uh, that have allergic problems to sort of understand the mechanisms that drive um, the fundamental sort of predisposition to allergy as well as severe allergic reactions. Uh, such that we can apply them back to healthy people who have mild allergic disease as opposed to sort of these severe syndromic situations. And so um, these are a short list of um, a dozen or so congenital disorders of glycosylation which have been associated with uh, immune dysfunction. Um, what you can see is that the majority of these have been associated with something called uh, neutropenia or uh, neutrophil chemotaxis defects. And so these individuals, it may just be that we notice these defects more because if you don't have neutrophils, you can get very, very sick. Um, and so um, as shown in this elect scanning electron micrograph, um, what you can see is a neutrophil here. Uh, and this is actually in a bladder uh, where there's E. coli, but other gram-negative rods certainly can abound in other places. And so these neutrophils are incredibly important for trapping and, and, and sort of getting rid of these gram-negative rods, which can cause a lot of serious infection uh, if allowed to run rampant in the immune system, and that's likely why we've identified a bunch of um, CDGs in association with neutrophil defects. Um, but certainly, it's not all um, a, a problem of losing. Um, in some cases, with MOGS, which um, Dr. Hanover mentioned earlier, uh, there's been a very interesting story where this trimming enzyme, this MOGS enzyme, which normally sort of curates um, uh, complex and glycans in a, a particular way, um, when it's missing, um, you actually have resistance to enveloped glycoprotein viral infections. So this is actually a picture of a lymphocyte being infected with HIV virus. Uh, and individuals with this disorder actually have resistance to this exact infection, as well as other glycoprotein enveloped viruses. So um, while it's not necessarily the trade-off individuals might be looking for, it certainly is informative in biology and certainly something we can learn from. So um, despite the number of disorders that are associated with immune um, changes, uh, I'm really going to focus on PGM3 today, part because it's near and dear to me. Um, we worked on this in, um, in collaboration with a large group of folks, which I'll mention at the end, were able to sort out what was going on in the two families that I'll discuss today. Um, but also uh, because I think it's incredibly informative about how missing a really fundamental building block um, sort of early in this process can have drastic uh, clinical effects that we're still trying to get our heads around in terms of how exactly these glycans are going awry and how this is causing a problem for these individuals. So um, I'll start with a story about a young boy who was sent here from Egypt um, who was referred for something called a hyper IgE syndrome. Um, before I delve too deep into that, I think we're going to have to do a couple segues along the way. And the first is, what in the world's IgE? Um, for those of you who are aware of IgE, um, you can close your eyes and nod back for about five minutes. But for those of you who know a little less, um, this is kind of the basic schema of allergic sensitization and reactions. And IgE is the allergic antibody. And so the way this works is in the right host under the right circumstances, antigen, um, or allergen in this case, is taken up by an antigen presenting cell, in this case a dendritic cell, and presented to a T cell, a naive T cell, 
on class two MHC um, in the form of a peptide sitting on that class two where the T cell receptor recognizes it. And as I mentioned, this has to be sort of activated in the right sort of milieu, if you will, to drive this to become a Th2 cell or an allergic effector cell as opposed to a Th1 cell. And those Th2 cells that are now specific to that antigen make allergic cytokines such as IL-4, which promote B cells who are also recognize that same antigen to make IgE, which then gets into the blood, floats around. Mast cells that are in the tissue, these are tissue resident effector allergic cells. They're born in the bone marrow as sort of precursors and float around until they sort of deposit in your skin, in your nose, places that you may have an allergic reaction. They actually reach into the blood and grab IgE with these sort of long tendrils out of the blood and stick it on their surface on this high affinity IgE receptor or FC epsilon R1. So then you've had this whole priming event happen. Let's say this is peanut that you're allergic to. The next time you see peanut, uh, that peanut protein or one of the proteins in peanut actually can crosslink this IgE and cause massive release of these mediators of acute and chronic allergic inflammation, which such as histamine. Uh, tryptase, things like that, which is why antihistamines can prevent hay fever, et cetera. Um, this can be sort of sh local, short-lived, or wholesale. So you can have just a runny nose from getting in contact with a cat, or you might have anaphylaxis from eating a peanut. So um, there's varying degrees of why this happens and, and sort of lots of details that I'm happy to discuss at my best um, sort of at the end, but it's kind of beyond the scope for the moment. So that's IgE. And there are some individuals that are classified as having hyper-IgE. We don't tend to like this kind of uh, label simply because we think it can be a little bit misleading if it's interpreted in the wrong or misinterpreted, really, in the wrong context. And so uh, I'll kind of give an example of a few disorders that cause high, high IgE, but the vast majority of people with high IgE do not have a known disorder. Okay. So this, this young boy, 12-year-old uh, young man, was referred from Egypt um, with a hyper IgE syndrome. Um, he had significant elevation in IgE. We're talking about 300 times the upper limit of normal, so about 30,000 uh, international units per mil. Um, he had moderate to severe atopic dermatitis, which is just eczema, itchy skin, uh, food allergies to multiple uh, foods, asthma, allergic rhinitis. Um, but he also had some infections. He was having recurrent skin uh, infections with some soft tissue abscesses. He was having recurrent pneumonias. I'll have a picture of one in a second to show you. Um, and he had chronic sort of draining otitis externa, or sort of external ear infections that sort of just chronically drained on him. Uh, what was also interesting about this young man is that he had very low white blood cells, um, low neutrophils, as I mentioned, many of the CDGs have low neutrophils, uh, but also had low lymphocytes, which kind of gave us a little bit of a clue as to what might be going on. So our second segue, and then we'll sort of continue moving on with PGM3. So uh, to give you a little sense of what a hyper-IgE syndrome is, at least in our minds a little bit, or at least a couple of conditions that can lead to hyper-IgE in terms of genetic mutations, um, the, there are two forms um, that have been described in the literature up until now, um, and some might consider PGM3 among them. Uh, so there's the autosomal recessive form. So these are loss of function mutations in DOC8. Um, DOC8 is a sort of uh, an important molecule for regulating actin filament sort of movement. It's actually a um, guanine exchange factor, but its role is thought to be related to cytoskeleton uh, rearrangement. And these individuals have um, sort of a number of traits, but across them and individuals with the dominant form, the first described form of hyper IgE syndrome, which is caused by these STAT3 dominant negative mutations, actually, um, the triad of high IgE, atopic dermatitis or eczema, and um, skin or lung infections was sort of the initial description. Uh, and both of these do indeed have those things. But importantly, what we see in DOC8 is that it really has somewhat of a combined progressive immunodeficiency, um, whereas that is less the case uh, in STAT3. Certainly, they do have problems with T-cell-mediated memory and with uh, humoral immunity or antibody production, um, but not, not as severe as um, the DOC8 patients. We also see a heck of a lot more severe allergy in DOC8 patients than we do in STAT3 patients. Furthermore, I'll take, show you a picture in a second, but cutaneous viral infections, warts, molluscum, uh, things of that nature are really profound and negatively impacting the lives of patients with DOC8 deficiency. Whereas in STAT3 patients, dominant negative STAT3 patients, um, these are much less um, prominent and much less um, deleterious. And finally, there's this whole connective tissue story that we see in patients with um, 
STAT3 dominant negative mutations. Incidentally, I should have mentioned this at the outset. This is the so-called Jobes syndrome, if you've heard that, or the ADHIES, um, autosomal dominant hyper IgE syndrome. Um, they have these connective tissue problems, vascular abnormalities, scoliosis, so a curved spine. Um, or they hang onto their baby teeth. They don't lose their baby teeth. So as they get older, they have supernumerary teeth that have to be extracted, um, which we don't see in, in DOC8. And I include here uh, severe atopic dermatitis because these patients can have every bit of high, if not higher, IgE than patients with DOC8 or STAT3 mutations. Um, certainly, some of these are probably genetic mutations and genetic diseases and monogenic disorders, uh, but certainly environment and multigenic uh, sort of components contribute to severe atopic dermatitis, and many of these other features are really not seen. So uh, lastly, I should also mention that for the purpose of today's talk, there's this concept of TH17 mediated immunity. Um, we don't know a ton about it. It's been studied a heck of a lot, but I think there's still some disagreement as to what exactly it's doing. We certainly think it has a role in fungal immunity in terms of protecting us for certain kinds of yeast and fungal infections. Uh, and it's been associated with a number of autoimmune disorders, particularly uh, multiple sclerosis and uh, psoriasis, among others. Um, but we, we do know that Job's patients certainly don't have uh, really any TH17 cells to speak of. So that's just simply important to contrast to what I'm going to sh share with you about PGM3. So that's the backdrop. I guess the last, last point, sorry, I keep kind of drumming on, neurologic defects are really not present in these folks either. Okay. So here's a couple pictures of, of patients with um, uh, high IgE states. So here is a patient. These are uh, uh, quite significant warts on virtually every finger makes, makes it just miserable uh, to deal with. Uh, here's a patient with uh, severe curvature of the spine. Uh, and it's actually cervical instability due to STAT3 mutations. Uh, and, but then here's an individual who you can say that certainly does not have normal skin. This is severe atopic dermatitis um, in a typical distribution where it's quite inflamed. Um, and this individual has no, has no known mutation, certainly has an IgE in the 50 to 60,000 range, um, and certainly might get lumped into this sort of hyper IgE syndrome. So getting back to our patient, uh, importantly, this individual uh, was born from a consanguineous union, suggesting that this might be a recessive disorder we're thinking about. Um, but his early childhood was really fairly uncomplicated. He, the pregnancy was uncomplicated. There were no infections during, during his um, nine months in utero. He, there were no uh, complications at birth. He was born by C-section. Um, and early, early childhood, really no illnesses. Um, but shortly after a couple of years of life, he started to develop recurrent infections of the skin, of the lungs, ended up getting hospitalized in Egypt. I apologize for the quality of this image. We were just ecstatic to get one. Um, and so what you can see here, um, this is a reconstruction to image, and this is actually a CT scan, obviously of not fantastic quality, but of sufficient quality uh, to realize that one of these things is not like the other, right? We don't have to be a radiologist to realize that there are these multifocal infiltrates in this right lung field, and you can see here at the right lung base, that are really not present in gross um, inspection in the left lung, but you can actually see there are some other uh, perihilar infiltrates and multifo multifocal densities on that left lung as well. So this is sort of a multifocal pneumonia that's the real deal, um, which can sometimes be quite tricky uh, to tease out in a kid, and we were very excited to have sort of some hard evidence that indeed this was an infection. We don't know for certain whether this was bacterial. It may have been bacterial and fungal, um, but certainly he was given broad spectrum uh, antibiotics and antifungals and recovered from the infection. So I mentioned that the known CDGs up until this point, and this is, I guess, two or three years ago now, um, did not have any associated neurologic deficits. But when we evaluated the patient here, we did notice there were certain characteristic neurologic differences in this child, and we wanted to set out to sort of understand what was going on and how to characterize them further. So he did go and undergo uh, neuropsychiatric testing here, and he had some delayed um, development in terms of his sort of reasoning level at, um, at age 11 is when he had that evaluation. Uh, he was reasoning at what was determined to be about roughly six-year-old level, um, and he was having quite a bit of difficulty with sort of visual spatial problems. So neuropsychiatric testing is where you go through the series of different kinds of tests and tasks to try to assess what skills and abilities and understanding and emotional responses you have to a number of different stimuli and questions. And he was dis had actually displayed clinically discoordination. So he had a little bit of a wide base gait. Um, he had impaired fine motor control and visual tracking. Um, he had a little bit of speech uh, uh, difficulty where he would sort of have delayed speech uh, and a little bit of discoordination and slow processing. 
Um, and he had had a history of febrile seizures, although we don't um, know whether that was just true and true and unrelated or at all related to this. So we wanted to get a little bit of better sense of what kind of functional change we were dealing with. And so I was trying to get a good picture of exactly what he underwent, and I thought maybe we would just try it. So this is uh, something similar to what we would call a visual evoked potential. Um, I hope if anybody sort of gets motion sick, just close your eyes for a second and I'll tell you when it's over. And so basically what a patient is asked to stare at a screen, and generally there are sort of these boxes that are black and white, and uh, they have probes sort of attached to their visual cortex in the back of their head. Um, and then the screen kind of flashes. And when that happens, um, this is actually a really fantastic functional MRI picture of someone undergoing this exact sort of clinical experiment, if you will. You can see um, this sort of tracks of the visual. So the eyes would be up here. And this is, these are the optic tracks, the optic um, uh, radiations. And then this is the visual cortex that you can see light up. And so what we can actually do is by putting probes back here, just on the outside of the head, and passively flashing lights in front of this little kid, we can determine whether he has changes in neurologic conduction. And we don't have to stick needles in him or do anything sort of invasive or, or painful. And so I'm no neurologist, but what I can tell you is that when this happens, you have this evoked um, event, this flashing light, and then you have this change. And the second dip is what they measure, this P100 value. And in a normal individual, you can see that each one of these boxes is 30 milliseconds. And then you can see that each box this way is 10 uh, microvolts. And normally, it takes somewhere in the order of 90 seconds to get to this dip. But you can see in our patient, it took about twice as long. So every time he's seeing something, it takes twice as long to get to the visual cortex as it would a normal individual. And this corresponded actually quite nicely to um, some interpretation of, of some fancy MRI images um, that uh, Danny Reich, one of our collaborators, was able to help us with. And what you can see is that there's very subtle light areas um, where they should be dark. And this is hypomyelination or dysmyelination. We're not exactly certain. It doesn't look to be progressive. It seems to be fairly stable over time. But it corresponds quite nicely to this delayed um, signal propagation. And, and just to remind you, myelinate, myelin is sort of these little sheathy things, little insulators that allows for rapid propagation of, of neurologic um, synapse information. So. Um, Importantly and interestingly in our patients, um, this kind of dysmyelination pattern uh, looks a heck of a lot like multiple sclerosis. Now, these patients do not have multiple sclerosis. But um, interestingly, a collaborator of ours, Mike Dimitriou at UC Irvine, um, has been able to demonstrate in a number of sort of mouse models and, and now in, as well in humans that, in fact, um, environmental and genetic changes in certain pathways that alter N-glycosylation, particularly in T lymphocytes, um, seems to predispose patients to multiple sclerosis in this similar kind of demyelination pattern. And importantly, in mouse models, N-acetylglucosamine can rescue a similar kind of myelin problem uh, in, in the EAE model. Um, interestingly, uh, in this model, um, it seems to be that N-acetylglucosamine is able to actually specifically inhibit, um, in particular, that TH17 group I was talking about a little bit ago, um, which, as I mentioned, was associated with things like psoriasis. And indeed, this young man had a lesion that looked quite a bit like this, in which um, there was this plaque with, that was well demarcated, sort of uh, scaling on the surface with this dark base, um, which was consistent with a psoriatic plaque, or looks a lot like plaque psoriasis. Um, incidentally, I don't show the data here, but these individuals do have quite a bit of circulating TH17 cells um, relative to controls. So it all kind of fit together a little bit. So in addition to um, the index patient I mentioned to you, we were able to have um, speak and meet the brother and then also subsequently a cousin who came to NIH for evaluation over actually a course of about a year and a half. Um, who had really a lot of the same problems. In fact, the, young, the younger brother of our index patient had a lot of allergy problems, uh, skin infections, neurologic problems, um, was sort of auto-destroying his red blood cells. And we're not sure still whether that's a fragility problem or an autoimmune problem, although you can make cases for both. Had significant elevation in IgE. You can see in the normal, normal's less than 90, so that's quite high, as well as high other immunoglobulins, low lymphocytes. Um, and importantly, the nine-month-old cousin who um, whose IgE level was not terribly high, did have significant atopic dermatitis, skin infections, and at nine months of old age was unable to sit on a system, which is not a typical milestone. It's quite delayed. And neutropenia. 
so while we were working with um, Alex Freeman and folks in the LCID to evaluate these patients, work up uh, what was going on, and we were performing exome sequencing in that family, there was another family that had been followed here at the NIH for actually, I think, a decade and a half, maybe, um, that uh, Jennifer Puck, when, when she was here uh, working with Steve Holland, um, um, I think before the LCID was the LCID, um, followed a family and described them um, in which they identified uh, immunodeficiency uh, in this um, really unfortunate family in the sense that they had uh, five affected uh, children um, and it's a non-consanguinous union. So it's just very, very bad luck. Um, with uh, cutaneous vasculitis, myoclonus, and cognitive impairment. And at first blush, you might not think that that sort of matches the description I've told you, except for perhaps the myoclonus. Should mention the vasculitis is a similar kind of autoimmune process, so perhaps that might fit. And there is the neurologic problem, but what about the allergy? Well, it turns out um, this is a clinical photography of one of the affected individuals. And I hope you can appreciate the quite severe nature of his atopic dermatitis um, in an area that he can't really scratch. Uh, in addition, there was scoliosis present in this family, and in fact, when you look back through, uh, virtually all of those kinds of findings we were seeing in our index family uh, were also found uh, in this family. And um, through sort of a collaborative coincidence, uh, another group was sequencing um, this family. Uh, Helen Sue's lab, actually, was who discovered DOC8 deficiency, was working on these folks. And we basically came to this, the gene at the same time, and that was PGM3 in both of these families. And so. Our family that we uh, initially um, sequenced had, was homozygous for this uh, D325E mutation within the magnesium binding domain of PGM3, whereas the other family had this frame shift and um, another non or a missense mutation in the phosphate binding domain. Uh, and the frame shift protein was not expressed by tra on the transcript level. And what you can see in this sort of space filling model of, of um, the PGM3 enzyme, which incidentally I feel like we should have said by now, phosphoglucomutase 3, um, has two mutations. Uh, or the two mutations, the one in the magnesium binding domain is shown here, uh, and the phosphate binding domain is shown here and sort of blown up here. But you can see they sit right sort of at this, uh, at this active site where um, glucose 1 and 6 phosphate are interconverted. And so we think what's going on is that those mutations are, are not allowing it to get into that space to actually have that transfer happen of that phosphate group. Um, and is leading to a problem. So I'm going to elaborate a little bit on the allergy, but just to remind you, the allergy is a part of this picture. Infections are part of this picture. Autoimmunity, uh, we think, is part of this picture, and this neurocognitive impairment. So this was a new syndrome. This was a new, new constellation of traits um, associated with this PGM3 deficiency. And now sort of the, the hard, the yeoman's work really began of, of trying to figure out how this was happening, how the, these diverse problems were arising from loss of the single nucleotide sugar. Um, and I should also mention, uh, since our uh, characterization of these two families, our collective characterization of these two families, um, there's now 20, 29 individuals from 13 kindreds that have been described across the world uh, with this disorder. And um, the clinical phenotypes are even broader than what we first identified, including skeletal dysplasia and a number of individuals who actually have severe combined immunodeficiency. I show you the first report of uh, a severe combined immunodeficiency here, um, but there have been uh, subsequent reports of SCID as well in, in other PGM3 deficient individuals. Luck uh, fortunately, many of these patients have been successfully transplanted um, and doing quite well. So what's at the crux of this? And I think Michelle set this up perfect. It's so great to go after these guys because the, all the kind of fundamental glycobiology has is, is already been described better than I can do it. So. Um, but as mentioned, PGM3 is very important for that uh, production of that UDP and acetyl glucosamine. And working with the Hanover lab, and Michelle in particular, we were able to show that UDP gluconic levels um, are low, both in primary um, or peripheral blood mononuclear cells, or PBMCs, but also in primary dermal fibroblasts. We've looked in a couple different compartments. And so um, the reason I got so interested, and the reason I think this is so fundamentally important for our understanding of allergic disease is that these individuals have virtually every form of allergic disease. And we're talking about seven people um, who have essentially every form of allergic disease that I know of except for contact dermatitis, um, which is sort of an atypical kind of allergic problem. Um, and so it seems that UDP glucnac is particularly and singularly important for the development of a myriad forms of allergic 
uh, disorders. And if we can understand the fundamental mechanism by which this is happening, perhaps we can learn quite a bit about sort of the underlying pathophysiology of ATP in general. So um, as I mentioned, and as, as has been mentioned, UDP uh, is fundamental to this, this uh, to end glycans. And so one of the first things we wanted to look to see is, one, could we find abnormal end glycosylation on these patients? And two, could we develop an assay to screen a little bit better? Because these guys, would have, uh, some of these guys may have been missed um, with sort of traditional screening techniques such as um, serum transferrin. And so in addition to that, that core, or kind of budding core, uh, glycans, end glycans sitting on a dollar call that John described earlier, um, inside of the ERI and Golgi, um, UDP glycnac is incredibly important for specific kinds of branching. And one form of branching, as shown here, is entirely dependent on it. And so Mike Dimitri has done a lot of work in this, uh, where he's looked in both MS patients and in mouse models, showing that this particular arrangement of um, UDP glycnac, this particular branching arrangement, uh, is entirely dependent on UDP glycnac levels. And so we hypothesized that, in fact, if our patients, if we were right, you know, if our UDP glycnac levels were true and those were lower in our patients, that we should see reduced branching of this kind of complexity of n glycans. And as it turns out, there's a lectin, um, a sort of a gift of nature, if you will, um, that you can get from red kidney beans uh, that recognizes exactly that. And you can purchase it as a, um, a fluorophore conjugate um, from a, a company, a commercial company, and actually run flow cytometry. And so that's what we did. And indeed, we've been able to establish an assay where we can stain just peripheral blood, peripheral blood mononuclear cells. We stain for, with a number of markers and look in different compartments because uh, the defects seem to be compartmentalized, which for details I can address, but I don't go into here today. But in particular, when we look in naive cells, I'm showing you naive CD4, but it virtually holds true in naive CD8 as well. We see substantial reductions in n glycan complexity using this LPHA uh, lectin binding flow or lectin based flow cytometry assay when comparing to other disorders that we described earlier of super high Ig or hyper Ig, uh, as well as looking at a bunch of controls. So this is a really nice screening test because the the highest value we obtain from PGM3 doesn't overlap the 99% confidence interval of the lowest um, of the groups. So. We can use this now clinically to screen and have started to use this clinically to screen for other patients with PGM3 deficiency or similar glycosylation disorders with, which also disrupt the same pathway. Haven't found any yet, but we're still looking along with folks in NHGRI. So how might N-glycosylation uh, affect the kind of immunologic and allergic phenotypes we're describing? And we have some data uh, that I'm not going to share, but I'm just going to share this schematic um, and I have the data actually in the end if people want to look at it. But there's a molecule on T cells and on other cells, but on T cells called CTLA-4. And this is sort of a break on, on the T cell. Following activation, this gets upregulated and expressed on the surface such that a normally co-stimulatory molecule that's present on an antigen-presenting cell sort of binds to it and says, no, don't go any further, calm down. So when that happens, the immune system kind of gets a bit of a red light and the T cell activation and proliferation is sort of held in check. Well, it turns out that CTLA-4 surface expression is virtually entirely dependent on appropriate end glycosylation of that molecule. And so it's not a problem of making it, but even if it's there, if the glycosylation is wrong, it doesn't stay on the surface. And when that happens, um, a different molecule that's already on the surface can kind of jump in there, a co-stimulatory molecule called CD28. Um, and that can be recognized, recognize that same um, uh, uh, ligand, if you will, which gives it, the T cell a green light to proliferate and, and kind of become an activated effector. When that happens, T cell proliferation becomes unrestrained. We see inflammation. And through a process that uh, 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 has been sort of the life's work of Mike Leonardo's lab in the LI, um, this whole idea of activation-induced cell death, where this unrestrained kind of activation leads to actual um, eventual death of, of, of the T lymphocytes. And so we can explain both, potentially explain, at least in one mechanism, both uh, the lymphopenia as well as the unrestrained inflammation using this model. And we're working to confirm, in fact, that uh, CTLA-4 is differentially glycosylated uh, in PGM-3 at the moment. So in addition to altered n glycan complexity and potential effects on this CTLA-4 molecule, and obviously the vast majority of, of immune molecules are glycosylated, so uh, it's not certainly limited to that. 
Um, I'm also gonna speak briefly about oglycnacylation and how this might contribute to allergic problems. And again, this is sort of very still uh, in, in its uh, early days of, of uh, vetting. But oglycnacylation, as Michelle described quite nicely, is just the single sugar addition of glycnac coming from this UDB glycnac precursor. What's really important about this and what makes it very complicated and, and difficult to study is that uh, a number of remarkably important transcription factors and pathways are affected by this process. And virtually all of them can be affected and oglycnacylated without affecting either their, their phosphorylation state or their nuclear localization. So our sort of typical techniques of understanding how these pathways are activated, for instance, STAT3 becomes phosphorylated, um, glycnacylation may affect STAT3, phosphorylated STAT3's activity without affecting whether it's in the nucleus or whether it's even phosphorylated. So we set out to look to see whether we could see abnormalities in PGM3 because as we mentioned before, we saw that these patients have reduced UDP glycnac levels and if that's the case, we should see less oglycnacylation. It seems pretty straightforward. So we looked in PBMCs and we didn't see a difference. So we were kind of scratching our heads and said, what the heck, like this should be fixed, right? Like this should, this should, this should be the way it is. But as it turns out, um, and as it typically is, biology is a little bit more clever than we are. Um, and so what these patient cells had done was upregulate OGT in um, significant excess of controls and downregulated the enzyme that removes that glycnac OGA such that they can maintain, at least in mass, on sort of a large scale level, normal glycnacylation, oglycnacylation of, of the proteins within the cells at the expense of having almost no OGA expression or activity. So why is that important? Well, um, John Hanover's group has um, fortuitously made the OGA knockout mouse, and we were able to mine some of his transcriptome data and uh, have subsequently done some of our own mass spec uh, experiments to try to evaluate this further. And what we can see is that the transcriptional profile in OGA deficient um, mouse embryonic fibroblasts, so there is that caveat, um, basically have a similar kind of predisposition as we might predict in our patients. We see upregulation of genes involved in allergic priming and Th2 differentiation, as well as eosinophilic inflammation, and downregulation of uh, immunomodulatory Th1, Th17, uh, or excuse me, Th1 immunomodulatory uh, molecules, as well as uh, other sort of stop gaps that normally suppress the kind of inflammation we're seeing in the patients. And so what we think is going on is that it's known that the rapid on-off of these oglycnac residues is quite important for a number of cellular processes. And indeed, in these folks, with the lack of OGA and upregulation of OGT, we don't think these are cycling. We think once it's on, it kind of gets stuck there on longer. And um, we're working to prove that right now. So the, kind of the last bit of the talk uh, is just that in any of these kinds of situations, we're always looking for a way to treat or modify the disease. Uh, and certainly in these folks who uh, have been refractory to many kinds of therapy, we were looking for a new way to try to approach this. And so we were able working, and this is actually data we worked on with Hud Fries's lab at the, um, down at the Sanford Burnham Institute. Um, we were able to show that exogenous and acetylglucosamine in fibroblasts, these are primary fibroblasts, um, was able to rescue the phenotype. So first of all, the control fibroblasts shown in blue have more UDP glycnac at baseline than do the PGM3 deficient fibroblasts, but the addition of, of UDP glycnac, or of glycnac was able to restore the total levels of UDP glycnac um, in the fibroblasts of PGM3 in purple, essentially to no difference from controls in red. And more recently, uh, looking at these OGA and um, oglycnacylation defects, we were able to show again in primary dermal fibroblasts that the OGA activity was substantially lower at baseline in PGM3 deficient fibroblasts. However, with uh, increasing amounts of N-acetylglucosamine, we can essentially normalize um, the OGA activity in these folks. And so uh, I guess it was about a year and a half ago now, um, based on these findings, we uh, initiated a protocol to treat these patients, or subject these patients, I guess is a better way to say that, to uh, supplement, supplementation to look at this, any structural and functional changes in the immune system. Um, and I don't, didn't really have time to get into it here today, um, but certainly what we've seen is that rather than, um, while we can restore the, what looks to be some of the sugar levels and, and glycan problems in these patients, um, it 
preferentially restored the effector cells as opposed to um, the regulatory cells. Um, and we think we have a handle on as to why that is, and it's a whole new hurdle to try to overcome. Um, but we hope, based on these kinds of experiments, we continue to develop new therapies, not just for PGM3, but also for people with allergies in general, if this tends to be a common thing. Um, so as with many clinical studies and projects, there's a large and vast number of collaborators, both in basic sciences as well as in the clinical side. I just have to mention uh, Alex Freeman and Dirk Darnell, who help. Um, Alex is sort of the, the staff, or staff physician who has um, done the vast majority of the clinical care of these patients at the National Institutes of Health, and Dirk is their study coordinator. Um, obviously, the Hamov Lab has, and Michelle as well has, has um, contributed quite a bit to this work. Um, as uh, John mentioned at the outset, I do continue to work with uh, folks in the NHGRI, in particular Lynn Wolf, to uh, evaluate patients in the UDP looking for more of these kinds of, of uh, disorders. Um, and uh, with that, I guess we can answer some more questions if people have them. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you. <clears throat> Whoops. My foot fell asleep. Oh, silly. Uh, do we have any questions? If you do, please speak up. Here. I have the hand. Whoops. You mentioned that PGM deficiency, total deficiency <laughs> is little. Uh, complete right? deficiency, sorry, yes. I'm complete okay. deficiency. I'm going back to your one of your mutations <laughs> that are defective in the frame shift region in the phosphate binding yes. domain. Yes. I believe it, it's homozygous, right? No, that's a compound head. Ah, yeah. Yeah. So that, so that mutation that you showed. So we're actually making a conditional knock in mouse right now of the of the other allele. The so, L4A D frame shift. Yeah, so the frame shift is a stop gain and it's a, it's uh, it's not expressed. It's not expressed. And so it's compound het with this E five two nine Q. And then the other patients are homozygous for this D three two five. Oh okay. So brings me to the second question. Um, there are high KM and low KM enzymes, all the enzymes you had. The very first addition is probably the low KM. Uh, as you go up further, maybe they require higher concentration. So that, how does it feed into the OGA, OGT play? Is it the levels of UDP, black mag that regulates the OGA and OGT levels? Or OGT levels just get upregulated? How do you explain the upregulation of OGT and downregulation of OGT? So Dr. Hanover is probably the best person to explain that. My, my impression of it is that uh, the it's the UDP, uh, it's the UDP glicnac level that's being sensed through the mechanism of O glicnac addition, um, and even I believe OGA is O glicnac related, um, and so the concept is similar to that of hypoglycemia um, in this setting, and so at least that's how I think about it, where these patients essentially, to the cell, are walking around as if they're hypoglycemic, um, and that is leading to this. Uh, auto regulation of those two enzymes to try to maintain a normal glycnac level. I don't know if you. Yeah. <laughs> the one thing, the one thing that, for those of you who are interested in early embryonic development, these enzymes are associated with the Hox gene clusters, which are principally involved in the whole formation of the metazoan body plan. So they are, they are actually in the, uh, the Hox clusters that are regulated by higher order chromatin structure. So. This pathway evolved as really, as really a genomic responder to nutrient. And so uh, kind of gives shivers down my back when I think about that because uh, it really is probably key to understanding a lot of these metabolic disorders associated with transcriptional regulation. So, yeah. And it happens remarkably rapidly. So if we take um, primary T cells from patients um, and just simply withdraw glucose and glutamine from um, from the culture medium, uh, it, it, within an hour we see massive uh, downregulation of oglycnacylation, um, and within a few hours we see changes in gene transcription of OGT motion. Well, let me ask a question. This may be a little bit wild, but do people with PGM3 deficiency respond to immunization with uh, uh, glycan-linked antigen? Not wild at all. Um, so. It's a complicated question um, because 
their uh, humoral responses are not normal. They're sort of deregulated anyway. Um, as far, insofar as we can tell, they can respond to pronate antigen pr fairly well, po polysaccharide antigen not as well, but well enough to, we think to be mostly protected. Um, one of the individuals here actually had a membrane of proliferative glomerular nephritis that required rituxan, so now he's on immunoglobulin replacement. Um, but as you can see, one of the individuals, their total IgG was 2,000, um, and some of that was uh, specific to immunizations. Now, functionally, does it work as well if the end glycosylation is different? Um, so far as we can tell, the in the folks that have looked at it, um, plasma cells, because we think because of metabolic changes and changes in gene expression, um, are relatively normal in these patients in terms of their end glycosylation. And when people have looked at immunoglobulins, because there's a great story about how altered FC and glycan expression or changes in the, in the end, end glycan of the FC on IgE um, drives anaphylaxis or can basically completely obliterate any risk for anaphylaxis if you, if you cleave it. Um, but when people have looked both at IgG and IgE, they have not seen significant differences in end glycan expression by mass factors. Well, I want to thank you. Thank you all. That was very exciting, very complex uh, world. But these, uh, all the PowerPoints are on our website and accessible as well as selected readings so people can uh, read further and think about these. But thank you very much. It was really very exciting.